Hi. So yesterday we worked on five related rates problems, and um, I could probably do another 10 of them and they, because they are a lot of fun to do. Uh, I tried to um, give you a couple of examples that might lead into what you might be doing in the future. For instance, we did one with circuits electrical circuits where we had to use Ohm's law to know the relationship between voltage and current and resistance and we saw how the rate of change of one of those affected the rate of change of the others. And the same thing if somebody was interested in being a chemical engineer and not an electrical engineer showed how um, if you have a tank and water is draining into or out of a tank how the change in volume affects the change in the height of the liquid in the tank. So these are types of things that in those professions you might be interested in. I decided that really you need to practice more than see me do any more, except maybe one more. So at the beginning of today, we're just gonna do one more related rate problem. We won't take too much time on it, and then we'll go on to a completely new topic. So, and try to see as we do this one, how even though all these related rate problems seem completely different, they're really done pretty much the same way. So, this is for those of you who might have gophers in your yard and want to take a good view of them. So, I happen to know of a super gopher who propels herself upwards from a hole so that her position above the ground level is given by this, where T is measured in seconds, and t equals zero is now. So where is she right now? Y of zero, her position would be zero. So it's right at ground level. And y of t is measured in feet above the ground, so zero would be ground level. Your head is 50 feet away from the hole at ground level. So you've got your head right down on the ground because you don't want that gopher to see you. You're laying on the ground. You want to know how fast the angle between the ground and your sight line changes two seconds from now. So often in these related rate problems, you want to draw a picture. So here's the hole. Gopher is going up in the air. Here's your eye and here's your eyesight the gopher. It's going to start here and it's going to go up here. So two seconds from now, and that's when you want to kind of draw it, is about what it might look like sometime in the future. Then what the next thing you do is you label things that are changing and are relevant. Well, this is changing. So I'm going to label it as Y, the distance up. We are interested in how fast this angle is changing. So I better label that as something and I'll call it theta. This is not changing. It's 50. That's given to in the problem, it's 50 feet. So this is also changing, but it doesn't seem to be relevant to the problem right now, unless we need it. So why add another variable if we don't need it? So what are we trying to find? How We're trying to find the rate at which is, this is changing. We're trying to find d theta dt. And they kind of don't give you any rates, except we've got a position equation. So from this position equation, if we take its derivative, now we know how fast this is changing. So I think we now are looking for a relationship, and it's got to have theta in it, and we don't want to have the hypotenuse in it, so I think the tangent would be our best relationship. So we say the tangent theta is y divided by 50, or 1 50th y. And now we could solve for theta to take d theta dt, 
But then we would have the inverse tangent function, and I don't think right now we want to deal with that. So instead, we're just going to take the derivatives implicitly, and we always take it with respect to time. So what's the derivative of the tangent of theta? Well, the derivative with respect to theta would be secant squared of theta. But with respect to time, we have to remember that theta is a function of time, so we've got to do the chain rule. So we say secant squared of theta times the derivative of theta with respect to time. And this is what we're trying to find, so I'm glad that showed up after we took the derivative. And the derivative of 1 50th y with respect to time is 1 50th dy dt. After you take your derivatives, you want to plug in numbers. And the only thing we shouldn't have is d theta dt. Well, what are we talking about? We're talking about two seconds from now. So what is the picture going to look like two seconds from now? Well, if we put in 2, we'll find out what y is at time 2. It's negative 16 plus 66 or 50. So we know that y is going to be 50. And we could use Pythagorean's theorem, but this side and this side are the same thing. So what we have is a 45, 45, 90. So we know the ratio is 50, or the numbers are going to be 1, 1 square root of 2, or 50, 50, 50 square root of 2. So what is, at this time, what's the secant of theta? It's the hypotenuse divided by the adjacent. It's just 50 root 2 divided by 50, or root 2. And what is dy dt at time 2? We just plug in to how fast y is moving, the derivative, and we get negative 16 plus 33, or 17 feet per second. And I think our, we're now all ready to solve. This is just 17 over 50, and this is 2, so d theta dt is going to be 17 over 50 times 2, or 17 one hundredths, and it's theta, so it's radians, and we're dealing with seconds as time, so the angle is changing at 17 hundredths radians per second. Now, just really quickly before we leave this problem, just to show you, you don't always have to add an extra variable. We can actually have t. We always have t in these related rate problems. So what I could do is, instead of calling that y, I could call it minus 4t squared plus 33t. So what, what I would do then is change this to the tangent of theta equals 1 50th, and in place of y I put minus 4t squared plus 33t. So this side would be the same thing. You'd still get 2 d theta dt. But on the other side, you get minus 8t plus 33. And now when you plug in time 2, you get the, seven, the negative 17. I mean, you get the 17 that you had before. So you get the exact same answer if you do it that way. And we never really introduced the variable y. And you didn't have to do the chain rule because t, you're taking the derivative with respect to time. So anyway, have fun. Do more of these related rate problems. I think you will enjoy them. And there's lots of them in any calculus textbook. Now we're going to go to something completely different. 
So, but it's so much related to what we've been doing. So take a look at this very familiar graph, y equals x squared. And I tried to draw it fairly accurately this time. So what if we're trying to find the derivative? Well, if we're trying to find the derivative, what we're doing is at every x value, we're trying to plot what the slope of this graph is. So if we look at it right here, the slope is 0. So we would plot, I'll make it a hole there, even though that's really a point there. I want to make sure you see that this is on my derivative graph. And then at every point, we're going to look at the slope. Well, right here at 1, when x is 1, if I look at that slope, the rise looks to be twice as big as the run. So the slope we could say is 2. So when x is 1, on the derivative graph, we want to be at 2. When we get up to x equals 2, the slope is steeper. It looks like the rise over run would be about 4. So when x is 2, the derivative graph would be 4. At negative 1, the slope there seems to be the slope here, but just negative. So negative 1 would give a slope of negative 2. And if we did that at every point on the graph, what you would get is something that looks like that. Not perfect, but... And we kind of know what the derivative graph should be. y prime of x or f prime of x is 2x. So this is really the graph of y equals 2x. And I tried to be careful to do that so you understand that there's only one possible graph that could be. If you really were able to do it accurately, this function only has one derivative graph, and it would be f prime of x equals 2x. And that's going to be true in general. Every function has exactly one derivative graph. But what if we were going the opposite way? Pretend for a minute that that blue parabola graph wasn't there, and we just had that black graph, and say that's the function, and we wanted to know <coughs> that's the derivative function, we wanted to know what function it came from. Well, we would just have to kind of think backwards. We'd say right here, say we started right at this point right here with our regular graph, we'd say, oh, the derivative says the slope should be zero here. So we would make a zero slope. By the time we got to x equals 1, the derivative graph would say the slope is 2. So we would have to work our way up until we got a slope of 2. And, that, and you'd keep doing that all the way along, and I hope you realize that you'd get exactly that parabola if you did it accurately. So it works the same way backwards. The question is, though, what if instead of starting here, I started down here? Then I still start out with a zero graph, but by the time I get over to here, I have a slope of 2. So I would have to go up something like this. And by the time I get to here, I have to have a slope of 4. This isn't going to be perfect. But you get something like that instead of something like the blue. And if we had started right here instead and looked at the slopes, we'd get something like this. And it'd have the exact same shape. So the point I'm trying to make is every function has exactly one derivative graph, but if you have the derivative, there's a whole bunch of different functions that it could have come from. So if the derivative graph is 2x, it could have come from what? x squared? It could have come from x squared plus 2, and it could have come from x squared minus 2, or x squared minus 3. 
So in general, it's going to be x squared plus some constant. And we've kind of shown that every function has one derivative function, but every function has an infinite number, and now we've got to call this a name, antiderivative functions. The red, the blue, and the green are all antiderivatives of the black. So this is the new topic that we're going to be talking about for a while. So let's try to come up with a definition. So since we have this new idea, we should probably write down a definition. So we're going to say an anti derivative of function f of x, and we haven't really given a name to this yet, but for right now, let's say, call it big f of x, defined on an interval from a to b, is a function such that, and this is going to be pretty important, that when you take the derivative of that antiderivative, you get back to the function for all x in a, b. So that's what we call an antiderivative. And then the family of functions and we'll call it f of x plus c. We're calling it a family of functions because they look all the same except for the constant that's added to them. It's called you could call it the family of functions, but it's got a special name. It's called the general antiderivative. The general antiderivative of the function that we started with. So, when we had the function 2x, An antiderivative we found to be x squared, or x squared minus 2, or x squared plus 1. So in general, the general antiderivative would be x squared plus c. So if these are really going to be important, and right now you just have to kind of take my word for it, but they're going to be as important as derivatives were. So we're going to want to be able to take antiderivatives of lots of different functions. But maybe we don't have to go through as much work as we did when we found all those different derivatives of functions. Maybe we can just work backwards in our head. So let's think about it. What if the function was x squared? What can we take the derivative of to get back to x squared? Well, the first thought might be, x cubed. But if you take the derivative of x cubed, you get 3x squared. And we only want x squared. So maybe it has to be x cubed times 1 third. And now, if you take the derivative of this, you're going to get this, even if I add a c. Because the general antiderivative, when you take the der derivative of a constant, it goes right away. I think we've got a general antiderivative for x squared. It's nice that we can kind of check these. It's like if you know um, multiplication, you can always check a division problem. 2 times 4 equals 8. You can see if that's right by going 8 divided by 4 and see if you get 2. So x cubed. You know when you take the derivative of x to the fourth, the power goes down. So maybe you need an x to the fourth. But when you take the derivative of x to the fourth, you get 4x cubed. 
and you only want x cubed, so we need a one fourth. Do we see a pattern here? I hope we see a pattern. If this is x to the n, what always happens? The power goes up by one, x to the n plus one, and then you always divide by whatever that power goes up to. And what we have is something that's an analogous to the power rule with derivatives. When we took the derivative of x to the n, we got n x to the n minus 1, and we use it all the time. This is analogous to that for antiderivatives. So it's going to be a really important one. We don't have to memorize all these, we just need to know that one. And I am going to remind you, if I didn't already tell you, back when we did the power rule for um, derivatives, we used the binomial theorem in the proof, which means that we really should only be able to do it for positive integers n. And I think I told you at that time, and I'm going to tell you again, that for right now, take my word that it also works for negative numbers and fractions. It's not until the last chapter of this course that I can really prove that to you, but it is true and we will prove it. Which is nice because I can use this also if I have x to the one-fourth. I, I can still use this rule. What would it say? It has to go up one to five-fourths, and then you have to divide by five-fourths, or multiply by four-fifths. So we can do all kinds of these fractional powers. We can do negative. What if you have x to the negative Three. Again, we can use this and say x to the n plus 1, negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2, and then we have to divide by negative 2 plus c. So we're saving us a lot of time to do general antiderivatives over how long it took us to learn how to do derivatives. Now, the other important thing we did was trigonometric functions. These were the six trigonometric functions, sine, tangent, secant, and all their co-functions. And all the co-functions had a negative when we did a derivative. So the only ones, at least for now, that you really have to know how to do are going just the opposite. So if we had the derivative of the sine is the cosine, so the antiderivative of the cosine is the sine. And the antiderivative of the secant squared is the tangent. And the antiderivative of the secant tangent is just the secant, and the antiderivative of the sine, well, the antiderivative of minus sine would be the cosine, so the antiderivative of sine is minus the cosine. And we could do the other two. You sort of have to know those, although they don't show up very often. If I had um, cosecant squared of x, or if I had cosecant cotangent, you would just have, this would be minus the cotangent of x, and this one would be minus the cosecant of x. And we've pretty much done everything that we know derivatives of, and we now know how to take antiderivatives of. So what else, did, what else gave us a lot of power with derivatives? Well, one thing is we learned the product rule. 
Well, there isn't really an antiderivative product rule. There's something you will learn at the beginning of Calc 2 that's kind of analogous to it. But for right now, you don't have to worry about that. There never is any quotient rule for antiderivatives. And the last thing we learned was the chain rule. The chain rule doesn't really have an anti-chain rule, but there's something that's really close to it. And we're going to learn how to do that in the maybe two videos from now, or three videos from now. But for right now, the only thing I want to get to is that really is an anti-chain rule to some effect, is what happens instead of having cosine of x, what if you have the cosine of 3x? Well, we know if we take the derivative of the sine of 3x, we get the cosine of 3x times 3. So really, the antiderivative of the cosine of 3x isn't the sine of 3x. But if I then divide by 3, it works out. Because when I take the derivative of the sine of 3x, I get the cosine of 3x times 3, and then I divide by 3, and I've got the answer. And that's going to work for all the trigonometric functions. So if I had, say, the secant squared of 5x, and I wanted to know the antiderivative of that, we know it's going to be the tangent of 5x, but divided by 5. And the general antiderivative would have a plus c. I think we've come a long ways with general antiderivatives in one time. So let's see, to end this video, find the general antiderivative and look at this function. In one day, we're going to be able to take the antiderivative of something that complicated. Now, the first thing I would probably do is get rid of that radical sign. What could I call 2 times the cube root of x? 2x to the 1 third. So we can use this rule over here and also call this 9x to the negative 2. Just so we don't, because we don't have any quotient rule. So let's call the general antiderivative, for lack of a better thing right now, we'll call it big F of x. So what do we get here? We have that constant, but then this goes x to the 6, it goes up by 1, and then you divide by whatever it goes up to. Then you do the same thing here. 4x, it goes up to 3, and you divide by 3. Now on this one, we've got 2. Now we go x to the, goes up by 1, so x to the 4 thirds, divided by 4 thirds, or times 3 fourths, minus, and this would be 9x, what, what's 1 up from negative 2? It would be the negative 1. So to the negative 1, divided by negative 1, which would make that positive. Then we've got the secant tangent. Well, we know the derivative of the secant is the secant tangent, so the antiderivative of the secant tangent is the secant. But because this is 3x and not just x, we have to kind of do the anti-chain rule and divide by 3. And then, what's the antiderivative of a constant? That would just be 150x. Because the derivative of 150x would be 150. 
And then since it's the general antiderivative, I do a plus C. So we were able to take the general antiderivative of that really varied, complicated function with only one lesson. Certainly you can simplify slightly, but you could call that 9 over x. But it's correct the way it is right there. So anyway, good. We've learned something new. We're kind of getting into the second half of a Calculus 1 class, and we'll go further in the next lesson.